I'd like to say um, good evening to everyone uh, on tonight. Thank you for joining us uh, via uh, Facebook uh, and YouTube. Our services on tonight are canceled on location um, due to the dropping in the temperature. I was outside the church and there's like um, black ice all around the uh, sanctuary. So it definitely would not have been safe for us to have church uh, on tonight. Um, someone possibly would have slipped and fallen. So, but we thank God for technology. We thank God for the ability to still be able to connect. I hope you all are gathered uh, around your smart TVs, your computers, uh, with your family, your notebooks, and your Bible. And we're going to continue our verse-by-verse -verse study in the Gospel of Mark. But before we do that, let's uh, have a word of prayer. God, you are so good. We tell you thank you for your goodness and faithfulness unto us, O oh God. We tell you thank you for being uh, the God of the weather, O oh God. We know that you control it all, O oh God. And so, Father, we tell you thank you, O oh God, for the sunshine and the rain. Thank you for the fall and the winter and the spring, O oh God. We know that you work out your purposes for our lives uh, throughout all of these things, O oh God. And we just tell you thank you right now, God. Now, Father God, I pray for all of those who are listening to this Bible study right now, God. We know that there are many issues, many problems, many sicknesses, oh God. Uh, many of us dealing with death in our families and bereavement, oh God. I pray that you would have mercy right now in the name of Jesus, oh God. Bless everyone who clicks on this video, oh God. Uh, make yourself known in their lives, oh God. And as we come to study your word, Father God, I pray that you would be with us, oh God, that our time together would be fruitful in the name of Jesus, oh God. Lord God, I pray for each and every one of them. I give them a portion of this prayer that whatever they may be standing in the need of, that you would look and have mercy right now in the name of Jesus, oh God. We give you all the praise and glory. And all my heavenly Father's children said, amen, amen, amen. Uh, God bless you to each and every one of you in Jesus' name. And we're um, going to continue our verse-by-verse -verse study in the Gospel of Mark. Um, and we're going to be looking at what is traditionally known as the triumphal entry. Um, Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through um, 11. Now we're going to go through uh, to verse 11, well, 1 through 11. Um, now we know that um, start go going back to chapter eight of Mark, that uh, Mark has uh, has shown us that there's a shift now uh, that has taken place in Jesus's ministry. And the shift is that he's now focused on preparing his disciples for his death. And so we've seen up until this point three different times where Jesus says to his disciples, I'm going to die. They're going to kill me. They're going to mock me, spit in my face. But on the third day, I'm going to rise. And we understand that throughout the Gospels that they still uh, did not understand any of, of the things that Jesus was saying. We understand that the Bible tells us in John, in the, in the Gospel of John, that after his resurrection, all of these things begin to come back to their memory as to why Jesus was saying the things that he was saying. It all began to make sense after um, his resurrection. And so uh, on last week, we were in at the end of chapter 10, and we were amazed to see how focused Jesus was on the mission of going uh, to die, of going to Jerusalem. The Bible says he led his disciples into Jerusalem and the disciples were, they were amazed and astonished. But he said to them even again on last week um, that he was going, he was going to die. He heals the blind man, blind uh, Bartimaeus. And now we pick up in chapter 11 and verse uh, number one. It says, now when Jesus, now when they drew nigh uh, to Jerusalem, to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village uh, in front of you. And immediately as you enter it, uh, you will find a coat tied on which no one has ever sat untie it and bring it. Now, this is th this is really powerful and we really can't go uh, any further than verse two uh, to really understand some things about Jesus. Now, the first thing that we see is that it says, now when Jesus drew not near, it says Bethphage and Bethany. So this is right outside of Jerusalem. You have Jerusalem, then there's Bethphage, and then there is uh, Bethany, meaning one meaning the house of dates and the other meaning the house of, of figs. Now, Jesus sends two of his disciples um, and, and it's believed that they're in Bethany. And so he sends two of his disciples to Bethphage in order to get um, this coat or this donkey. And he says to them that when you enter into the into the city, as soon as you enter into the city, you're going to see uh, in a place where two ways meet a coat 
tied. A, a donkey is going to be tied there. And it is a donkey, um, the synoptic gospels tell us that it's a, a, a donkey that no one has ever sat on. It is a donkey that no one has ever um, sat on. And then Jesus says, untie it and bring it to me. Now, Jesus is saying this before it ever happens. And so here we have a small, a small um, uh, uh, hint at his omniscience. We've been seeing these things all throughout the Gospels that he wouldn't be able to do this unless he was God, unless he is God. And Jesus proves here yet again that he is God. He tells them what's going to happen before it happens, thus proving his omniscience, thus proving again that he is God. But I want to show you something. Look at this this word right here, the donkey. I want you for a moment to, to focus in for a second on the donkey. He tells us that you're going to find a donkey in a place where their two ways meet. He's going to be tied up. I want you to untie him and let him go. Now, family, I want to tell you that all of us should see ourselves in that donkey. I'm not trying to say that you're a donkey, but it is a metaphor for all of us. And if you think about it, well, before we came to Jesus Christ, we all find ourselves in a place where two ways meet. We either are going with God or we are going with the enemy. And we are at a place of decision until God sent someone in our lives to untie us from the bondage of sin and bring us to the master. And so I tell God, thank you for a moment for those Sunday school teachers, for those preachers, for my mom, my dad, and all those people who uh, who would lead us to Jesus Christ. Because all of us and then even our unsaved loved ones and friends and those who we encounter on a day to day basis, they are all we are all like that coat. We are tied to sin. And then we are in a place where two ways meet, where we're either going with God or we're going with the enemy. And I don't know about you family. I don't want any of my family or any of my friends, any of those who I come into contact with to be tied to sin and then um, headed down a direction away from God. No, if God will give me the strength, if he will give me the ability, I want to help untie someone and bring them um, to Jesus. And so then we ought to see ourselves not only in the coat, but we ought to also see ourselves in the disciples that are sent. Each and every one of us has been sent to to help untie someone and bring them to Jesus. Who is that person that God has allowed in your life? Who is that person um, that you've been complaining about being in your life? Perhaps God has, uh, has providentially placed them in your life that you may untie them and bring them down the road to Jesus because all of us find ourselves in that place where two ways meet. And so he says, untie it. And bring uh, and bring it to me. Now watch verse three. It says, if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say the Lord has need of it and will send it and, and will send it back here immediately. Let me read that in the in the King James. It says in verse three. And if any man say unto you, why do you do this? Say ye that the Lord hath need of him and straightway he will send him thither. Now watch what verse four says. And they went and found the coat tied by the door without in a place where two ways meet just like Jesus says and what did they do they loosed him and the Bible says and some of those standing there said to him what are you doing untying the coat what did they say and they told them what Jesus had said and they let them go now I want to say say a few things about these verses now the first thing Jesus says to them now when you get there someone's going to ask you what are you doing loosen the coat now you tell them that the Lord has need of it and so then family I just want to share this with someone um, tonight that uh, that God has given me that task to say to someone tonight through his word that you have something that the Lord has need of that, that that's the reason why we give of our resources. That's the reason why we give of our time and our talent and our treasure. That's the reason why we give our very selves to the work of the kingdom. We do that because the Lord has need of it. Now, God could do the miraculous. God could save. Um, uh, God could go and evangelize himself, send out ministering angels to do the evangelism and, and, and do feed the hungry and clothe the naked and, and do this, that and the other as it pertains 
lines to ministry, but he has chosen you and I to do that work. He has ordained you and I to do that work. And family, can I tell you that you have some resources that the Lord has need of. You have uh, some time and some talent and some gifts and some ability that the Lord has need of. He is calling you to get involved in ministry. There's many of us who come to church Sunday in, Sunday out, and we never think about getting involved. We never think about um, what ways that we can uh, make the ministry better or help reach those uh, who are lost in the community or even those help teach those who are in the church. I, I want to challenge you to, to, to challenge yourself, to look at yourself, examine yourself and ask yourself, what are those things in my life that perhaps the Lord has need of. Look what the Bible says. It says, and they went away and found a coat tied at the door outside in the street and they untied it. Now, can I say this to you? Jesus tells them, here's what you're going to find. They go and they found exactly what Jesus is going to find. Now, I'm just I'm just blown away by their obedience because we know these are the disciples who are so cantankerous that they're always uh, questioning him. They're always doing the opposite of what God says. They're always uh, finding themselves uh, doing something contrary to what Jesus has told them to do. And thus, Jesus having to say things like, where is your faith or, or, or things like that but here they simply obeyed and they found exactly what Jesus said and family isn't that a word for us that we need to learn how to simply obey a lot of the issues that we find or deal with in our lives are unnecessary issues. Now, I know that in life we all are going to have storms. We're all going to have challenges. But some of those storms and some of those challenges are uh, brought on because of our disobedience, because we have not simply obeyed and simply done what Jesus told us to do. Let's keep going in the text. It says, and some of those standing there said to him, what are you doing untying the coat? And what did they say to them? They said to them exactly what Jesus had said to them. Look what it says. And they told them what Jesus um, had said and they let them go. Now, what if they would have said something else other than what Jesus said? What if they tried to give some other explanation other than what Jesus has said? Perhaps they wouldn't have let the coat go. Now, family, can I tell you that there are many folk who come to church Sunday in and Sunday out, and I thank God that it's, that it, that it's not Mount Pilgrim, but they go to church Sunday in and Sunday out, and they're coming looking to hear what the Word of God says, but they're hearing some preacher's opinion. They're hearing some teacher's opinion. We don't need life coaches. We don't need, uh, we don't need motivational speakers. We need to know exactly what God is saying. We need to know what the word of God is saying. And if you are, are, are teaching a class, then you need to teach what the word of God says. If you are preaching a sermon, then you need to preach what the word of God says. We live in a day and time where we exalt. Uh, if a man calls himself a preacher or a teacher, a woman calls herself a a preacher, then we just exalt them and take them at face value. But no, we need to examine what the word says. We need to be like the Bereans. The Bible says that they um, searched the scriptures diligently to see if these things were so. And that's how you and I ought to be. Don't just take the word of someone because they say they're a preacher. They say they're apostle, bishop, whatever they call themselves. You need to know what the word of God says. You need to say, sir, we would see Jesus. The Bible says they went and they said what Jesus said and they did what Jesus told them to do and they got what Jesus told them they would get. And I'm just believing that. Can I just can I just say that in the parentheses? I'm believing that if I will continue to faithfully preach the word of God, that lives will be changed, that souls will be saved, that people will be discipled and, and committed to Christ. I believe that if I, in our Sunday school, if we are just faithful and teaching the word of God, studying it for ourselves, applying it to our own lives and faithful and teaching simply the word of God. This is the reason why we go verse by verse through the word of God, because I believe God will speak if we will trust him enough to just allow his word to do the speaking and not my opinions or not my uh, my own philosophical stances. But what the word of God says is what we believe and what we try to practice. Amen. And so then as we continue, it says, and they brought uh, the coat to Jesus and threw it uh, through their cloaks on it. And he sat on it. Now, let me say this. 
Um, this scripture, this scripture here, what we know as the triumphal entry, it is uh, it, it, it's very powerful and very deep because it fulfills so many different prophecies, prophecies in, in Isaiah, prophecies in Zechariah that talk about um, the triumphal entry, him coming and the king sitting uh, uh, on, on the donkey. It, 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 this is prophesied. And then even in Daniel, it's prophesied that uh, the king would come to Jerusalem. And what's so crazy about that is that 483 years uh, to the to, to the date. I mean, the prophecy was 483 years and to the date, which is the 10th uh, of Nisan, Jesus walks into Jerusalem on the very day that uh, Daniel prophesied in his prophecy that Jesus would do that, that the Son of Man would do that. And, and so then now Jesus walks in fulfilling all of these different prophecies. And look what the Bible says. It says, and they brought the coat to Jesus and that they threw their cloaks on it and he sat on it and then it says and many spread their cloaks on the road and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields now watch this so the, the act of spreading coats in the way was a symbolic act seen in, in the Old Testament um, and, and, and seen in the Old Testament that this was an act of submission. It is to say uh, that we humbly submit ourselves to the king. We submit ourselves to your rule. We submit ourselves to your governance. And then the act of spreading uh, palm branches, cutting down palm branches and strawing them in the way is a, is a, is a, is a, a sign of rejoicing. It is an act of uh, rejoicing about the salvation, the coming salvation of the king. So now look at what these symbolic statements are saying, and let's try to examine ourselves. First of all, it's saying that they threw their cloaks in the way, which is an act to say that I submit myself to the rule and governance of the coming king. And then an act of joy saying I'm jo joyous about the coming salvation of the king. Now we know that, that, that they don't understand what they're doing. They're doing it because they believe that he's coming to free them from their earthly oppressors, that they're coming to uh, to, to, to deliver them from their uh, uh, earthly oppressors, deliver them from their financial hardships and all this, these different things. And so even though they are worshiping him, even though they are, they are praising him, they are praising him and their motives are not right. They, they are praising him out of ignorance. Now, here's my question. <clears throat> How many of us? Sunday in and Sunday out. This is our testimony. This is our prayer that, Lord, I submit myself to your rule. I submit myself to your governance. But when Jesus doesn't do what we want him to do, then we turn our back on him. We are uncommitted to the church. Why? Because we wanted him to come within a certain time frame, but he didn't come. We wanted him to do a certain thing, but he didn't do it the way we wanted him to do. We wanted him to answer a prayer, but he didn't answer that prayer. We wanted him to say yes, and he said no. We wanted him to say yes. And he said, wait. And because of that, we have now turned our back on God. Can I tell your family that your praise is not for real? Your worship is not for real. If what you are saying is what they're saying, I submit myself to your rule. I submit myself to your sovereignty. You're not submitting yourself to the rule of God. You're not submitting yourself to the sovereignty of God. You are submitting yourself to your own sovereignty and to your own rule, saying that if God, if you don't meet my timeline, then I'm done. If you don't meet my timeline, line that I can't serve you. Well, that's not worship. That's not, that's not actual praise. That's the same thing that they're doing in this text. <clears throat> we know that in this text, they're praising him today, but a week later, almost a, less than a week later, they're going to be hollering, crucify him. Listen, they're saying here, we submit ourselves to the rule and governance of the coming king, but less than a week later, they're going to be saying, we have no other king but Caesar. Now, I wonder how many of us have another king in our lives, even though we have our hands raised on Sunday morning. There's another king in our lives, and that king is our money. That king is our children. That king is our job. That king is something other than the king of kings. There ought to be no other king in our lives but King Jesus. Somebody say, right on, King Jesus. Right on, King Jesus. Look what the Bible says. Others spread leafy branches. That is, that, that is uh, the joy of the salvation of the coming king. <clears throat> now, the salvation that they think is coming is a salvation that's going to liberate them from their earthly oppressors. But you know what? 
We have a joy much greater than that because we have uh, an eternal joy. We have a joy that our king has freed us from the bondage of sin. He has freed us from the bondage of death, hell, and the grave. He has freed us from our spiritual oppressors, right? He has released us to life eternal because we've placed our faith in his finished work. And so we ought to have a joy that cannot be stolen by circumstances. We ought to have a, a joy that does not ebb and flow with the happiness of life, we ought not be stock market believers, right? Believers that when things go up, that when, when things are going good, the stock market is sowing. When things are going bad, the stock market is tanking. But we ought not have that kind of faith. Amen? Why? Because our faith is, is, is empowered by a joy in a spiritual salvation, in a spiritual reality. Amen? And that is an eternal reality that does not change. Amen? So as we continue, verse nine says, and those who went before um, and those who followed were shouting. Watch this. So there are those who are in Jerusalem who are and who have heard that Jesus is coming. Now, it's believed that there's some 100,000 people here, almost two million people uh, coming to Jerusalem by the time of the Passover, which is when Jesus is going to die. And then the Bible says this, uh, it gives us that it's almost like 100,000 people at this time. And there's some in uh, Jerusalem and then there are some who are leaving uh, Bethany and Bethphage with Jesus on his way to Jerusalem. So you have a crowd of people in front and you have a crowd of people in back and all of them are praising God. Isn't that something? What an uh, amazing scene um, to behold. And, I, and and sometimes it's like that on Sunday morning. It's just like everybody is worshiping God. Everybody is giving him praise. I would have loved to have witnessed um, this kind of praise, even though we know that it was an ignorant praise because they didn't really understand what Jesus was coming to do. And so they are shouting. Look what they're shouting. Hosanna. Now, what does that mean? That means save us right now. Save us even right now. Hosanna. Save us even right now. That ought to be our cry and prayer that when we come into the house of God, if anybody comes in unsaved, Hosanna. Save right now. When you're on your job, right before you clock in, say, Lord, if I, if I encounter anybody who's unsaved, Hosanna. R Lord, save right now. And then it says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So they believed that he was the Messiah. They believed he was the one that the prophets had prophesied about. But what they didn't know was he was coming to free them. Even though the scriptures say it, he was coming to free them from their spiritual oppressors and not their physical oppressors. It, it, it would have been a shame. It would have been a shame for God to deliver us physically, to give us the money that we need, give us the house that I need, and then leave our souls in shambles, leave our souls still tied like that donkey in that place where two ways meet. Now watch what the Bible says. They say, blessed is the coming kingdom of our father, David. Hmm. Blessed is the com coming kingdom of our father, David, Hosanna in the highest. Now, now why, didn't, why don't they say blessed is the com coming kingdom of our father, Abraham? Anytime the Jews talked about their father, they usually made reference to father Abraham. But they say David because it shows that they really believed Jesus to be the promised Messiah, the Messiah that the prophets had prophesied about that would sit on the throne of David. <clears throat> they understood that. But what it does say is that their uh, understanding was too shallow. They didn't understand that he was coming again to free them from their spiritual oppressors. And so he's coming uh, in the kingdom of our father, David. Now, what's so important, what's so uh, powerful about that is that David, when he was made king, he rode on a, a donkey. Here it is. Jesus is fulfilling that very prophecy. Now, now, it says, blessed is the, is the kingdom, king, kingdom of our father David, Hosanna in the highest. Now, verse 11, which is not on the PowerPoint, verse 11 says this. Watch this. And Jesus entered into Jerusalem. After all that, that great worship, that great praise came, came, came about. And verse 11 says this. Now, listen. And Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple. Right. And when he looked round about upon all things now the, and now the even time was come, he went out unto Bethany with the twelve. What, what, what a letdown. What, 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 what an anticlimactic end to such a great 
uh, narrative. Th th this great praise party is going in. It's going on. Everybody's worshiping, throwing clothes. They they're throwing branches. Everybody is shouting, Hosanna, glory to God in the highest. Jesus is riding on a donkey. Everybody is hailing the coming Messiah. And he goes to the temple, looks around, goes back home. You know what's so amazing about that? As I was thinking about that, Jesus being the Messiah, Jesus being the, the, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, they were expecting him to come in the town and roll right up to his throne, roll right up to the, to, 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 to the kingdom and, 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 and tell whoever's sitting on the throne, get out of my seat. I'm the rightful king. I'm sitting on this throne. But can I tell you, Jesus did go to his throne because his throne is in the church. He is the King of Kings, but his throne is in the church. You remember what Isaiah said, don't you? Isaiah said, I I saw the Lord. He was high and lifted up and his train did fill the temple. Do you see that? The train is the is the is the end of the king's robe that flows all along. But it filled what? The temple, which shows us that God's throne is in the church. He rules the world from his throne in the church. And so Jesus went to his throne, but he wasn't accepted in his throne. He went to his throne and he found crooks where his throne was. He went to his throne. He found money changers and he found he found a, a religious system that didn't honor him as the Messiah, as the King of King and Lords of Lords. And my question is, when Jesus shows up to this throne called the church, when Jesus shows up to this throne that, that, that called your heart, what will he find? Will he find himself welcome and herald as the king of your life? Will he find himself herald and welcome as the king of our church? Or will he find himself rejected? Everything going on but that which honors and glorifies him. And so we have here the triumphal entry. I'll leave you with just this. I'll leave you with this family that all of that which is going on in this text, um, it is it is fulfilling prophecy. Um, but it's also fulfilling. Listen to me, because this is going to bless you. God's timeline It's fulfilling God's timeline. God knows exactly what he's doing. Let me let me let me ask you a question. Why is it that we've been studying the gospel of Mark for over a year now and and, and we've seen over and over again those who try to praise Jesus, those, those who try to worship Jesus and, and herald Jesus just like these in this text are doing. And Jesus says what? Don't tell anybody. Don't, don't, don't worship me now. Don't say anything. Keep your mouth shut. Even when they tried to force him to be king, the Bible says Jesus slipped out from among them. And yet in this text, the text says that he's receiving their worship. He, he, he didn't tell anybody to be quiet. He tells them he just lets them go ahead and worship. Let, let them go ahead and praise. Now, why would you think that Jesus now has this sudden change? The reason why is because of God's timeline. We see because it's this worship. It's, it's, it's this praise. It's this frenzy that's going on here. It's this hundred uh, thousand plus people who are worshiping Jesus as the promised Messiah that's going to get him killed. This is what's going to really turn the tide, the heart of the of the chief priests and Pharisees to say, we got to kill him. It's this and it's also Lazarus. The miracle that he does in raising Lazarus causes a frenzy. We're going to see that uh, next week. And then also the fact that the people are now heralding him as the coming Messiah. Their praise has now turned the hearts of the chief priests and scribes against Jesus. So now the plan to kill Jesus is now expedited and set into motion. And now in this text, we are now less than a week away from Jesus's death. And so now Jesus um, allows them to worship. Why? Because he knows God has a timeline. Family, can I leave this with you? God has a timeline for your life as well. Perhaps you think that the pain, the suffering, the hardships, the trials that you've gone through in your life are random happenstance, just some random misfortunes in your life. But can I tell your family that when God has a timeline for your life, God will uh, God will use all of those things that happen in your life for your good. All things work together for the good of them that love God and who are called according to his purpose, right? The Bible says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you. What? In due season. The Bible says, don't get weary in well-doing. You will reap if you faint not. When? In due season, 
right? Due season is the is that other season, not winter, spring, uh, fall, uh, or summer, but there is due season. Due season means God's timing. God knows what he's doing. And there's no other place that we see this more clearly and more powerfully expressed than in the last week of Jesus's life. The, 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 the Pharisees are, are plotting, but it's working for our good. The Pharisees are, are trying, the chief priests are, are setting Jesus up to kill him, but it's working ultimately for our good. It's all in God's timeline. Judas is selling Jesus out, but it's all in God's timeline. He's going to betray him with a kiss, but it's all in God's timeline. All of these things that seemingly are negative, that seemingly all of us would say, no, I don't want to go through that. No, I don't want to experience that. All of that ultimately is going to work out for our good. It's going to work out for even Jesus's good because he's going to die for our sins, be buried, rise on the third day with all power in his hand. And that which he went through, uh, he went through it. And ultimately, we all are blessed because he did. Amen. And so then, listen, family, I know you find yourself going through hardships, going through trials, going through tribulations. It may seem like random, may seem um, like there's no point to it. But ultimately, in the end, you're going to understand that it all is working out for your good and not only for your good, but perhaps the good of someone that you will come into contact with in the future. God bless you. God keep you. Let's pray again. God, I tell you, thank you for our time together as we come to examine your word, oh God. I pray for those who have clicked on this study, those who will click on this study. I pray that something that has been said would be a blessing to them. I pray that you would forgive me for my feebleness in preaching, oh God, and allow your Holy Spirit, oh God, to make up the gap. I tell you, thank you now for your people, oh God. Bless them and bless them indeed. I pray for safety in the uh, in the climax, uh, in, the, in the climate of this weather, oh God. I pray now um, for those who may not be saved, oh God, that something that was said on tonight would prick their hearts, oh God, that they would surrender their lives to you and not superficially, oh God, based on your, based on their timeline, oh God, but they would surrender themselves wholeheartedly to you, oh God, knowing that your purposes is not to simply save, to not to save us from our earthly oppressors or our earthly hardships, but to save us from our sins, to remove us from the hand of the enemy who would have us to go to hell with him eternally, oh God, but placing our faith in you, placing our faith in the finished work of Christ Jesus on Calvary's cross, oh God, that which he did buried, died, buried, and rose on the third day, oh God, that you have promised, oh God, us a home eternally, oh God, in glory with you, that you have promised that we will be saved from our spiritual oppressor, oh God. And Lord God, I tell you, thank you for that promise. We receive your promise afresh, oh God. Now, Lord God, I pray for all of those, again, clicking on this video, that you would make yourself known in their lives and that they would surrender accordingly. Thank you, Lord God, for all of your goodness unto us. And all my heavenly Father's children said, amen. God bless you, God. I keep you. I want to take a moment to invite you again to our worship services on Sunday, Sunday school at 930, worship service at 11. We are in a series called Better, a series called Better. We are believing God that this is the year of better. And we know that there are some things that we've got to do ourselves if this year is going to be a year of better. God bless you. God keep you. And we'll see you real soon.